The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials in ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes from Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazines. Today we're really blending the two, Plein Air painting and that high level of fine art finish. Today we have Painting the Figure Outdoors with Ryan S. Brown, classically academically trained and also painting in Plein Air. Enjoy it. <music> I'm Ryan Brown and today we're filming a uh, how-to on how to paint the figure in the landscape. Uh, we are going to be putting this together from uh, studies we've done, I've done on site in plain air, uh, studies I've done from the figure, uh, uh, street landscape sketches, uh, and we are also going to talk about the use of photography in the process, uh, the use of preliminary drawings, uh, compositional sketches, uh, and how to put that all together uh, to create a painting in the studio. Obviously, that's what we're doing today. We're in the studio. We're not outside painting a figure. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's going to be uh, how to put everything together, com uh, collecting information uh, in order to make a composition in the studio uh, where you have a little bit more controlled environment, um, have a little bit more time to um, solve some problems um, for larger, more complex paintings. Um, okay, so here we, I'll just, I'll describe them one at a time. Here, uh, the palette. Um, I use mostly natural pigments colors uh, uh, and uh, a few Gamblin uh, colors and uh, one Old Holland color. Uh, so this is natural pigments lead white number two, uh, which is mixed, their lead white number two is mixed with a walnut oil uh, rather than uh, their lead, night, lead white number one is mixed with uh, linseed oil. Uh, so I like the walnut oil mixture. It, it extends the drying time just a little bit. Um, and over time, will tend to yellow just a, a little bit less. Uh, this color here is lead tin yellow. That's a natural pigments color. This is um, chrome yellow primrose, which is sort of like a cadmium yellow light if you were to, if you were to uh, be using like another brand. It's comparable to a cad yellow light. Uh, this is also natural pigments. It's a Blue Ridge Yellow Ochre, which is uh, kind of a very rich, deep yellow ochre. This is Minium Red, which is a really, really, really intensely warm, um, sort of orangey red, a very, very warm red. Uh, I, I squeezed that out. I'm not sure how much of it I'll use. Probably very little, but um, just in case, you know, um, I squeezed it out. This is orange molybdate, which is also natural pigments, and that is a, a again a very warm red, a uh, little bit cooler than than the minium, but still very very warm. Uh, this would be like a, if you were to use another brand, maybe like a cad red light. But um, the difference is, and the reason I use this one instead is because uh, it retains its warmth better when mixed with white, uh, which I really like. This is a genuine vermilion, which is just an all-around brilliant color. Uh, kind of a, a great balance between warm and cool. You can cool it off pretty easily, and, and it can you know, be warm, depending on the relationship it, uh, in the painting. It's a matter lake, uh, which you could also um, use like an alizarin crimson or alizarin. You know, Gamblin has an alizarin permanent that's pretty nice. Uh, all of these colors are, again, natural pigments. This is a cinnabar green. 
from natural pigments just a really intense um, green this is a gamblin uh, viridian which is a very cool green this is a gamblin sap green which is a very versatile green it's it's very transparent uh, um, very warm and very transparent uh, which i really like uh, and then old holland ultramarine blue deep uh, the reason i like ultramarine blue deep uh, versus the straight ultramarine is uh, the ultramarine, regular ultramarine blue tends to be just a little bit greener than I want and ultramarine blue deep leans more towards the purple uh, and I like that. Um, I also like that it's slightly darker in value. This is raw umber which I almost never use um, but for the purposes of this video I'm using it um, to get a little bit more, fa a little bit faster drying time. Uh, so I'll, I'll mix it in um, with some of my piles uh, just so that hopefully I can um, get this to, to dry a little bit faster. This is a uh, Gamblin Asphaltum. Oh, the, the raw umber is uh, a Gamblin as well. Asphaltum is a Gamblin color and it's a very transparent brown, uh, which, I, which I like. Especially, you know, I'll show you, uh, you know, when we get this started, you'll see uh, I use Asphaltum a lot in my underpaintings because uh, it, it creates a really sort of red, uh, warm, transparent brown, which is nice to have show through the, the, the rest of the painting. So those are the colors. Uh, this, it, this right here is a Natural Pigments Oleo Gel, which really is just straight linseed oil uh, mixed with fumed silica, which is an inert substance, uh, creates a gel, which is nice to just squeeze out on the palette uh, because it, it's like, you know, it stays gelatinous like the paint does and and uh, but basically it's straight linseed oil that you're you're using uh, and, I, and it eliminates the need for a palette cup that that's the list of colors um, the other things I use the brushes I use uh, usually are uh, you know rosemary and trichelle brushes uh, the the rosemaries that I love are um, what are they? They're the, the Long Filberts and Long Flats, Series 278 and 279. 279 is the flat, that's this, and 278 is the filbert, which looks like that. And these are genuine um, mongoose. The problem is that they're so awesome that they're like the best brushes you can get, but uh, you can't get them anymore <laughs> because the, they've outlawed the use of mongoose hair. Um, but but the shape of the hair, if you look at um, the the individual hair, it it it's so different than than other hairs. It's sort of a medium width at the base, and then it gets a little bit fatter in the middle, and then it really gets super fine at the very end. Um, and other hairs just don't do that. Uh, and so the way that it holds paint, I mean, it's very, very soft. And, and when you get them in the longer, when you get them in the longer um, length, uh, you know, normal length would maybe be here, and then the longer length is maybe half again as, as long. When you get them in the longer length, the, the, they hold a lot of paint, but they're also very, very soft. So you can really pile paint onto the surface but if you need to be really delicate, especially when working wet into wet, it's, it's really um, in, an indispensable brush. So I love those. Um, we just have to figure out a way to um, make it so that Rosemary can get more mongoose hair. Um, if anyone wants to start a mongoose farm or, uh, I don't know, they say that mongoose is like overrun in, in Hawaii, but they won't sell the hair to they won't sell the hair because they don't want to create like a demand for the mongoose. But if we can go find some really cool person in Hawaii, then we can like, like just get these made again because these are the most brilliant brushes, um, especially, especially for wet into wet. Uh, the other thing I use is rosemary. Um, uh, you know, again, this is the long hair filbert uh, uh, ivory brush which is a synthetic brush. And so a synthetic brush is so, sort of halfway between um, the stiffness of a hog hair bristle and the uh, softness of a mongoose or a sable or whatever. 
And so I really like these. And again, as we're going to be working mostly wet into wet, um, I'm using softer brushes. What I, what I usually use uh, with Trikel brushes are the, um, are the hog hair bristle, which I really like. And again, with those, I use the long filberts. They're just shaped like that. With this, I'll probably be using less of that because, uh, again, it's wet into wet, and the the, the uh, hog hair bristle are, are just not quite as, as delicate as I'm going to need. I do have some Trikel Golden Taclon brushes for some very fine work. You, you, know, you can see this is just a tiny little round. Um, when I use brushes like this, it's either on really small paintings or um, for very, very, very fine detail. Um, uh, but if I use these tiny little brushes too much, I just find myself getting super finicky and, and um, killing every little ounce of, of um, freshness in the painting. So I, I, you know, I try not to use too small of, of brushes. Uh, so that's the brushes. Uh, it covers that. Um, surface that I'm going to be using on this painting is uh, a very, very fine weave, pre-primed linen I got from uh, A&E Art in Brooklyn. Uh, it's lead primed. I mounted it to a, a gator foam, which is nice because it's lightweight, but um, I'm moving away from using gator foam just because it's it's not really that durable. So I, I you know I prefer uh, to do especially on this is only 16 by 20 canvas on something like this I would normally do I, I'd mount it on uh, a Baltic birch um, just because it's really sturdy. It's a little heavier, but but uh, it, it mounts easier to the birch. I mount it with a Beva film. Uh, so it mounts easier to the birch, and also the birch is just sturdier. So, uh, you know, I brought the gator foam because I was traveling with it and, and just to cut out, cut out weight. Um, and you can maybe see on, on the video I have a, a couple of, like, white spots through here. I'll just explain those. I'm, I'm figuring out how to make my own panels. I'm going through, a, a, you know, all these processes of, of figuring it out. Uh, on this one specifically, this is an early one I mounted, um, there's, n there's little knobs on linen, right? We all know there's, there's these little knobs on linen. And uh, so when I mounted it, because this, this linen specifically is so fine, uh, those knobs really pop out. And uh, instead of taking it off and going to the back with a razor blade and, and cutting those li little knobs off, I just cut them off here. Um, which in some places exposed a hint of the linen. So I just took some lead primer and, and went over those uh, little spots again. But normally now how I do it, now that I've gone through this, the dumb phase of figuring things out, now I'm smarter. Um, now before I mount it, I, I turn the canvas over and just with a razor blade lightly um, shave off the back of those, wherever those knobs are, just run my hands across it and, and feel where the knobs are and shave those off. And then I mount it and it's, it's really, really beautiful. Um, very, very fine linen. Um, so that I think covers all the basic materials. Um, just using odorless mineral spirits, Gamsol from Gamblin. Um, and uh, that, that's it, that's it for materials. So the, the process of how I make this whole painting is really pretty complex. I'm going to try and boil it down to something that makes sense. Uh, the, the idea of a, of a painting like this starts really simply um, with... Well, it, it started when, when uh, years ago... Um, when my, one of my daughters, she's 10 now, but she, when she was, I think, three, we were camping and uh, um, she pooped her pants and <laughs> we had to change her there in the camp. And uh, you, know how, you know how kids get there, like playing and like she's with her cousins and, and she's running around the camp and she doesn't want to take a break from playing to go to the bathroom. Plus she's scared of the, the pit toilets She's scared she's going to fall in and like drown in, in a pit toilet, which is really freaky for a, a, any kid. But 
So, so she didn't stop playing and she pooped her pants. So we are changing her in the, in the woods and there she is, you know, standing naked and she's just so, she's so like, doesn't care that she's naked with poop on her in the woods. She's just like, it's such a free, like innocent sort of experience for a kid. And, you know, I'm standing there helping my wife and watching and, and the, the flesh tone against the backdrop of all of this greenery and the, the rocks and the, and the dirt and whatever is just, was just so beautiful. Um, and, 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 you know, as a painter, I'm, I'm sure you guys can all relate. You know, you're always seeing, you're always looking at things um, like paintings. You're always um, noticing beautiful things around you. I mean, it's the best part of our job is we're, it's our job to, to look at beautiful things and recognize them. So as I'm standing here, you know, um, gagging and cleaning up poo and whatever, <laughs> I'm, I'm also lo looking at this really beautiful color harmony between uh, the, the subtle flesh tone of my daughter and, and the green behind her. And ever since then, I, I really wanted to paint the figure in the landscape. Uh, I love, really love, uh, trying to figure out how to paint flesh in the studio, you know, with portraiture or, or uh, the nude or whatever. It's, it's such a challenge to get the colors to feel fleshy, to, to get them to feel squishy. One of the best compliments you could get in a, in, in a 19th century atelier was, was um, if, if a teacher called your drawing or your painting supple. And, and it's such a great term for you know, you're talking about a two-dimensional surface, but you're, you're trying to make it feel supple. And, and I think that's uh, something that, you know, in the studio when I'm doing a figure or a portrait, I, I'm trying to figure out. And, you know, then, uh, then when, I, when you see the, that sort, same sort of flesh in the landscape with, with the different colors bouncing around, there's such a, a, a beauty of natural har color harmony that exists. Uh, between the figure and the landscape that really interests me and has interested me uh, for many years. But the figure in the landscape comes with a lot of like really particular challenges that you don't have in the studio, uh, such as um, air temperature and uh, uh, um, bugs. And, you know, we're doing this painting, we were doing a, 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 a figure in the, in the stream. So the water temperature was uh, a big deal. Um, we, were, we were doing it in a stream that was r sandwiched between a campsite and a, a, a main road. Not a main road, but you know, a canyon road. So ducking when the cars came by and, and making sure we were there on a day where there weren't any campers was, these are all like things that, that you don't have to deal with when you just hire a model and bring her in the studio. A lot of this led to some trial and error in terms of f trying to figure out uh, how, to, how to approach this whole subject. Uh, it took a lot of years for me to kind of come to terms with exactly how I was going to pull something like this off. A lot of failed studies, a lot of like really terrible uh, failed sketches, uh, things where we started a painting and then the model got too cold and we just had to stop. or or there was way too many hikers or mountain bikers or whatever, and it was impossible. Um, so, so this is kind of a culmination of years of figuring this out uh, and, and pulling it together. Um, but that's, that's where the, for me, that's where the interest started is, is poopy pants. That's, I think, uh, how, <laughs> that's how, that's how I decided I wanted to do this. So, okay. Um, the, the, the way that I started this was with a lot of, a lot of preliminary sketches and, um, and, and trying to figure out uh, um, pose. So I'm just going to pull some up here and show um, some different ideas that I had along the way. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, you know, I had a, I had a dress made. Um, and so we, we played with the idea of uh, having her wear a dress. Uh, and and we, we did it, you know, when she was dry, just sort of dipping into the water. And then we had her dip all the way in and have it be somewhat 
um, transparent, um, different, different types of poses with that concept. Uh, and and one, of the, one of the keys for me is trying to get, trying to make sure that the figure looks natural, that it's, um, it doesn't feel posed. Uh, so, so when you are posing a model and you're, you're asking her to follow directions, uh, you know, oftentimes it can feel a little bit static and, and contrived. So, um, you know, a lot of the direction I'm giving the model when we're out there is, is just to sort of move around, um, you know, and s spin in a circle or climb up on that rock or climb down. And, and as I do that in, in the landscape, I'm photographing all of it. Um, because, and I guess I, I could talk about that now. Well, let me, let me finish talking about the sketches on site and then we can talk about that. Um, it's a different model, different pose, uh, some more development of the, of the idea. And then here's some, here's some sketches just from the area uh, of, of different elements, you know, looking at uh, just a, a tree and maybe how the leaves come in front of it, um, the distance behind it. This is one I did with Eric Rhodes in the Adirondacks a few years ago. Um, again, just a, you know, I brought this, even though it has nothing to do with like the area I was in, the balance of greens, how the light hits uh, the leaves, um, how, you, how I'm, you know, moss on the, on the tree trunk, uh, the balance of greens to the, to the grays of the rocks. The, you know, it's a really helpful study that I just keep in my studio because it, it has so much information in it. Uh, this, is, this is one done from the same canyon, just a, a pool. And the thing that's going to be important here is um, you know, the, mo the moving water here uh, and, and how it's rolling over the rocks and, and catching the wetness of, of some rocks versus the dry area of the rock. This is just a really helpful study um, that's going to come in handy when, when I'm looking at movement uh, because that's what the study was. This, this uh, particular sketch was done very specifically to understand the movement of water. Uh, so that's going to help me when I'm, when I'm down in this area uh, trying to create that same sense. This is another study done for the same reason. Uh, and so you know, having multiple uh, views of something like that, you know, a subject like that really helps me define it better when I'm making a studio painting. This was done in North Carolina at a workshop I did uh, last year. And again, the balance of greens, the overlapping information, uh, creating distance, uh, uh, th these, these are all really helpful uh, hints when I'm, when I'm painting in the studio. All of, all of that helps inspire the development of an idea for a painting. Uh, one of the other things that, that I use a lot in the development of, of the concept is photography. Um, a lot of people shy, shy away from the use of photography for one reason or another. Uh, I, I think the interaction between nature is very, very important. The understanding that you get from that interaction is very important. It's something that if, if you're just working in the studio from photography, um, I don't think you can overcome the photography. Uh, I really think you have to combine that with your knowledge and experience from nature. But the, but the photo is, is just a useful tool in really particular ways. And, and as an artist, you have to know what tools are available for your use and how best to use each of those tools. What are the, what are the, uh, the positives and negatives of each tool? If I want to do a really, really particular study of, say, the basic topography of a rock, I can sit there for three, four, five hours and draw it with pencil. And the pencil is like a, um, it's like a, a a very precise scalpel that's going to allow me to to define very very precise things in terms of drawing. Uh, if I wanted to look at more mass or value, I might use charcoal 
to do that. Uh, um, it's a little bit faster. It's a little bit more massy. I get a larger range in value. Uh, so, so it benefits me in ways, but I can, you know, maybe I can't be as precise as I could with pencil. So there's benefits and drawbacks to each of those tools. If I, uh, if I need color, obviously I'm going to go to, to oil paint because I have my greatest range in value and my greatest range in color. Uh, and combining all, of, all three of those gives me information that I otherwise you know, wouldn't have if I were to just do one or two of them. So gathering all that information is really important. Using the tools at your disposal is really important. And I look at photography as one of those tools. I have an idea in mind for, you know, I, I know the model I want to use, I know the basic location I want to paint her in, and I kind of know the feel for what I want uh, to, to paint, the, the, the general idea for a painting. I can kind of visualize basic compositional elements. But when you get to the location and you start uh, looking at the model and she starts moving, there's a lot of different inspiration that happens uh, during that time. And there's no artistic tool that will allow you to pause time uh, to consider those uh, different changing elements like, like a photograph will. So what I do is um, I usually hire a model, we go out to the location, and we go over the idea. We use that first session for maybe an hour or two just photographing and, and developing the concept. The last thing I want to do is make a painting that looks like the first photo I thought looked cool. Uh, I don't want the photograph to have any element I don't want it to have any overriding uh, power in the final work. I want it to be sort of an, an inert tool that is in the background that, that, that really doesn't show itself. It's sort of like, like the linen. I don't, want you, I don't want somebody to step up to my painting and think about the linen it's painted on. I want them to think about the painting. I don't want to think them to think about the colors I used or which brushes I used, I want them to think particularly about the painting itself. So any tool I'm using is, is at the service of the final work. Uh, and so it can't, it can't have too much power in the process. So the development of the concept is very, very important for me. And what I do with all of those photographs that I gather in that first session is I, I go back home and I look over them and look over them and look over them. I, I, I start to get a feel for which, what slight variance in pose, um, the kind of feeling that it evokes, the, the emotion that it uh, establishes, uh, and, and how that connects with the environment around it, the rhythms throughout the figure, um, the potential narrative that it starts to develop. Those are all really important things to me. And what I've noticed is, when I paint specifically from life, because I do some paintings where it's, it's all from life, uh, the, th the thing I don't like about only painting from life is that you're forced to settle for the average in the, in the expression of the model. And oftentimes that, you know, for instance, in a, in a portrait, you're going to have a, a, a model that is, is slightly shifting her head this way, this way, or whatever. Uh, you're going to have her go through a series of emotions and, and, and thought patterns and whatever in the hours and hours it takes to paint her. And you're going to be forced to take all of that and condense it to a, a general average of emotion. Because you have to make the decision on the fly and, and lock the drawing in at some point, the good thing about painting from life is obviously that you do get to choose from a range of emotions, that you get to see a lot of those variations. But the bad thing is, is in, in my opinion, is that you have to settle for the average. When you, are, when you add a photography to the experience, the benefit is that you pause certain emotions. You, you get to, and, and when you pause it, you get to go home and think about it yourself and spend time really maturing uh, the concept of the painting based on some of those paused emotions and, and ultimately come to a, a greater sense of what you are trying to achieve 
in the final work. Uh, so, so that's that would be the first session, just to, just a photography session. Then, then when I decide this is what I'm going for, and I have a very very clear idea in mind of what I want, we'll go out and do some sketches on site uh, to get uh, color harmonies, value harmonies, uh, and and the basic uh, overall tone of the painting. Uh, we've got to figure out on location. When all of that is done, it's composition time, and you know, I'll, I'll take, uh, from, from this one area, I probably have, I don't know, 1,200 photos of di different angles uh, of the creek, different lighting as the lighting changed uh, from slightly overcast to direct sunlight to, uh, um, you know, where the light is going down and it's, it's maybe a few minutes before dusk, so everything is in a, in a slight shadow. Uh, and, and deciding how the light's going to fall on the model, how it's going to fall on the whole scene is, is also very important uh, in terms of defining color harmonies, value harmonies. So, and, and then the angles and how it all flows together is very important. So I'll do a, 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 some thumbnail sketches and try to fit the figure. How big do I want the figure in the landscape? How much of the landscape do I want surrounding the figure? Uh, and the, the rhythms throughout the landscape and the figure, these are all really, really important things. So um, when I kind of figure that out, I'll start with a, a basic compositional sketch, which is, which is what this is. It's kind of light. I'm, I'm hoping you can see that. Um, but the, the rhythms that I'm defining through here, and the, you know, the figure is... This is, this is invented. This is all invented. The figure, obviously, the pose for the figure is taken from the figure. I have uh, this preliminary sketch that I did of the figure in the landscape in that pose. Uh, so that's where I'm taking the pose from the model. Um, but once I have that, fitting the landscape around here is, is a complete invention. A lot of the different elements will be taken from uh, sketches uh, that I've done previously or, um, or just made up and mostly made up. So, so what I'm thinking about though is the, the rhythm and the flow, visual flow of how this is composed. So the way I, I um, draw that is I want to make sure that, that certain things like that line up, that I'm leading you back into the painting and that your, your eye is, is continually moving through the surface. So linearly, um, I, you know, I kept this drawing pretty well just at line so that, that I could kind of explain this better, but uh, you know, this lines up with the knee, lines up with this, and comes up to this line here, which then comes up through the top of this rock and, and basically matches the same angle as this here through the arm and straight down through there, which creates a really nice pattern for um, this whole section, this, this focus section. From there, you, I also have a line that comes from the top of this rock right down through the shoulder, down through this rock, which kind of crosses and, and really forces everything into, uh, visually into this, this model, which is offset to about the third of, of the canvas there, or paper is drawing. Um, and then again, we zigzag back through here. This line through here mimics the par or parallels this line. This line back here comes through this uh, little root and kind of parallels the same line here. This line down here sort of parallels this. And, and you know, when you, if you've done a lot of figure drawing, um, uh, you know, academic figure drawing, you'll see that these sort of parallels and rhythms exist in nature. So when I'm doing a final compositional drawing, those are things that I, wanna, I want to have as the underpinnings of the composition because even in the, en in the end, I don't want people to notice that. I don't want them to, um, to, I don't want them to be aware of it. It's sort of like the linen. I don't want them to know, like I don't want them to care about the linen. I don't want them to care about these underpinnings of composition. But I do want them to feel like there's a really beautiful rhythm uh, happening, some sort of natural flow to the, to the whole setup. Um, and if it's not there, there's always going to be something that feels a little awkward. Uh, and if it's there too, obviously, if, if in the final painting, these lines are really harsh and the edges are really harsh, 
that's going to feel just as awkward. So, so it's there, it exists, but, uh, but you know, in the end, I want it to be um, unrecognizable, I guess. I don't want them to think about it. So, so that is the uh, preliminary sketch, uh, preliminary drawing. That's eight, eight by ten. Uh, I knew I was going to try and do this around sixteen by twenty, so I did the initial sketch eight by ten, and I transferred that to uh, this eight by ten panel. Uh, the same, I think this is the same. No, same basic linen, really fine linen and uh, did this initial color study. So you can see in there that those lines of composition aren't necessarily like glaringly obvious, but, but they're there and it, and it creates a really nice um, sense of distance and space uh, and visual flow. So this is the initial color sketch, working out the idea. Really, the purpose for these is basically to just solve the problem. What is the, what is the final painting going to look like? The, the key to my s success is, is being able to see in the beginning what the end is going to look like. Uh, and if I have, a, if the more solutions I bring to the blank canvas, the better my whole process is going to be. And the worst thing you can do as an artist is put questions on your canvas. Uh, you want you want to solve things and put solutions on, put answers down, uh, because you know they look better than questions. So with this, with this eight by ten, um, I just uh, you know what I'll do is I'll photograph that. If I'm going to paint it larger, I'll photograph that and take it to Kinkos, and they have like a large, um, oversized black and white printer, and I'll just print that out at whatever size I want to work. So in this case, the 16 by 20 sketch at the same size, I'm going to do it. And then I just put charcoal on the back. I'll, I'll tape this up to a window so I can see through it and then put charcoal on the back and then tape it down to the canvas and just transfer it over. So you can see that transfer drawing here. And I have like a whole box of um, little charcoal nubs. You know, a lot of people throw these away. But I just, like when I was in Florence, I, I saw people throwing these away. So I'd take them out of the trash and just keep them because they're useful for like scrubbing or, or doing like transfer stuff like this. And I'm super cheap that way. Um, but I got like three or four boxes of these little nubs that I use for... Uh, scrubbing large areas of, of a charcoal drawing or, or doing transfers. So you can see I missed uh, an area on this transfer. I, you know, I just forgot to trace over it. So uh, I, I'm going to have to draw that on there real quick. I could draw it with paint, but for the sake of um, showing you this, uh, this is a, a great material to use. It's, you know, can you read that? Um, it's a General's Pure Willow, uh, and it's, it's a really nice charcoal to draw on canvas with because you can see it goes down easy, but it comes off without really staining, which is great. You know, I was using a different willow before, and I you know, try to pull that off the canvas, and it just leaves this really heavy stain. So um, and I tried this Pure Willow from General's, and it's, it's just really nice. So I'll just quickly... Um, get this, the rest of this side of the figure on here. I'm not going to try to be too specific because I can, I can draw it with paint and it just allow me to get to the point faster. I'm going to be kind of pushing that around. You know, the, the thing that I like about getting the drawing on here beforehand is that it, it'll, it speeds up the process a little bit because you know where everything goes. I mean, the basic, the basic placement is there. But in terms of drawing, 
a lot of this is, you know, I, I look at it as very, very malleable. I, I'm, you know, I might move these rocks, I might add rocks, I might take things away. I, I might change the, the whole complexion of, of this tree or whatever. Um, because as I'm um, painting it, I'm, I'm making decisions and I'm making decisions in terms of drawing as well. Same with the figure. I'm going to get a lot more particular with the painting um, as I go. And if I'm too careful about retaining the drawing, I, I kind of like close up. I, I feel like I, I, uh, I get a little bit more timid with the whole approach. If I'm using smaller brushes and less paint, I find myself like, like sucked into this um, canvas and, and, I, and I start to like color it in. And, and for me, I, I, want the paint, I want to use the medium to its greatest effect. And in paint is such a fluid medium that um, I really want to be able to push and pull and sort of sculpt with it. So uh, if I get too finicky about the drawing initially, um, and, and finicky meaning like, like I'm careful, I'm super careful, I want to make sure that it's right uh, and, and well, uh, um, well defined, structurally sound. But I, I, if I'm too careful and create like sort of like a, a cartoon outline uh, or a coloring book outline, I just get I get timid and I start to I start to like want to preserve that too much and and uh, at, at this point I'm con I'm really confident in my drawing skills so whatever whatever really really fine decisions I'm going to make final decisions I'm going to make in paint I want to do with the brush so so this drawing is sort of a guide but it's malleable I consider it malleable. So we're, we're about to start the painting now, and there's a couple of things I wanted to, to talk about and point out right before I do that um, in terms of what we've already discussed, which is the, the study phase, uh, the preparatory phase of making the painting. There's a couple of things I learned uh, that are going to help me make this whole process a little bit more fluid. So one of those things was um, like what key I, wa I want to do the painting in. And initially, uh, there's a couple of different lighting patterns that I saw when I was on location uh, doing studies. And, and one was a little bit earlier in the day. <clears throat> the, the, the direction I'm facing in the, in the, on the creek is south. And so uh, we got there at a time where the, the light had just gone over the edge of the, uh, the, the canyon. And so we're all in shadow, but there's a lot of ambient light coming up, coming down um, from above. And earlier in the day, uh, it's, it's still pretty flooded with light. That made the light on the flesh really pretty bright. So uh, one of the ideas was to get that uh, um, high key light on, this, on the flesh. And so one of, you know, a couple of the sketches I did uh, played on that, you know, I showed this one earlier, but I'll show it again. The light on, on her shoulder here and here is, is almost white um, to really kind of push the, the, the flesh up in value. You know, that's going to play off of the light on the rocks as well, being, being, being pretty high key. Also, um, the reflections in the water are going to be a lot brighter, and, and uh, you know, that was pretty appealing. So, uh, this other sketch, again, I, I've showed some of these earlier, but, but this kind of uh, is, is pretty high key as well. The, the flesh tone has to be carefully done in this case because of the white dress. Uh, you don't have to have space for that to be defined uh, as white, but uh, still pretty high key. Uh, the last study I did, you know, in, in preparing for this painting was this. Um, and that's, that's pretty high key. I've got some areas back in here that uh, um, you know I wanted to for that to read as light still hitting maybe the background of uh, the landscape and kind of popping through the trees, everything in in the foreground in s slight shadow. Um, but as I as I looked at that in the studio, I just I felt like maybe the the figure didn't integrate with its surroundings as well as I wanted it to, which which was 
in some ways positive. <clears throat> I, you know, the, the fact that the figure really popped off the page and stood out in the landscape was appealing to me. Um, but I did another study. Um, this one is of my daughter in the same, same landscape. Um, and this is on a slightly overcast day. And the light was a lot warmer. Uh, it was also later in the day, so it, it was less intense. And, uh, and so what we have is a, is a, lot, um, a, a lot warmer, lower in value glow that was happening in the landscape, which was really, really beautiful. This study that I did particularly appealed to me because of the warm harmonies between, you know, in the greens, the warmth of, uh, that I have in the rocks, and, and then uh, how that plays off of the lower value and, and warmth in the flesh that I'm getting. So after I did uh, the study of my daughter, um, or, or actually I did that one a while before, uh, but when I, when I played the two, the very high key study and the one um, that was a little lower key of my daughter, I liked the color harmonies that I was getting in, in the, the one of my daughter. So um, <clears throat> I did this, or this final uh, color sketch of the pose we're going to be using, uh, pr pr pushing those values down in the flesh a little bit more uh, and getting a little bit richer color because the, the, the reality of, of oil paint is that the higher you get in value, the less saturation you're able to have. So uh, you don't get both great saturation and very, very high key. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. So uh, by lowering the key a little bit, I can have uh, a little bit richer tones and, uh, and allow the figure to more cleanly integrate into uh, its surroundings. So that's the direction I went uh, and decided to go for, for, again, here's the final color sketch that I'll be using as reference. Um, still want a sense of that overall glow coming on the light of the rocks and on her shoulders. But I really want her to fit well into her surroundings. So a lot of the flesh tones are also going to be mimicked in the dirt, uh, in, in areas of the, in the, of the rocks. One thing I learned when doing this color study was uh, the colors that I was using in the rocks, I felt like maybe a little bit too cool. Again, just to contrast that with this color sketch, the, the color tones in, this, in the rocks are, are much, much warmer. And so they play a little bit better off of her flesh than these do. I think there's a, a stronger separation between the, these cool blues of the rocks here and the, and the flesh. And they tend to pull apart a little bit more, isolate, isolating the figure. And this figure feels a little bit more well integrated into its surroundings. So that's the one thing I'm going to think about. Um, it's a mistake I made in the color study that, that allows me to come to a, a better decision when I start this. So I'll stay warmer on this larger painting uh, than I did here. Figure painting can touch people on a deep and profound emotional level. And there's no question that landscape painting can do the same. But when you combine these two art forms, you come away with something that is truly magical. Now you can learn the techniques of painting the figure in the landscape from a master painter who is the head of an important figure painting school the Center for Academic Study and Naturalist Painting. In the all-new Painting the Figure in Nature instructional video, Ryan Brown provides you all the tools, all the theory, and all the techniques you need to produce your own masterpiece in this rare and exciting style. I might move these rocks, I might add rocks, I might take things away, I, I might change the, the whole complexion of, of this tree or whatever, um, because as I'm um, painting it, I'm, I'm making decisions, and I'm making decisions in terms of drawing as well. Same with the figure. I'm going to get a lot more particular with the painting um, as I go. But I, I, if I'm too careful and create like sort of like a, a cartoon outline uh, or a coloring book outline, 
I just get I get timid and I start to I start to like want to preserve that too much and and at, at this point I'm con I'm really confident in my drawing skills so whatever whatever really really fine decisions I'm going to make final decisions I'm going to make in paint I want to do with the brush so so this drawing is sort of a guide but it's malleable I consider it malleable you'll discover how to use your sketches to establish movements, balance tones, create the various elements of your scene, and better define your work. The common mistakes beginner and intermediate painters make and how to avoid them. Ryan will also demonstrate how to use anatomical landmarks to guide your adjustments to the figure, how to paint reflections of the sky, trees, rocks, and the figure on water, how to bring clarity to the different landscape elements, and develop your figure so the solutions to your painting reveal themselves. You'll also learn how to make the small, subtle adjustments that make your figure more dynamic, and much, much more. Not only will you get to learn from a true master painter who studied at the prestigious Florence Academy of Art, you'll also gain key insights into both figure painting and landscape painting that you simply won't find anywhere else. Painting the Figure in Nature with Ryan Brown is now available on DVD and streaming video. Well, that was Ryan S. Brown painting the figure outdoors, and you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, there's a special discount code in the comments section for you today only. Now let's get right to our interview with Ryan. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazines. And today I'm happy to have Ryan Brown with us. Ryan is the director and founder of the Center for Academic Study in Naturalist Painting. That's a mouthful. Did I get it right? You got it right. Okay, that's in Springville, Utah, which is a suburb of Salt Lake City and Provo. It's a wonderful little town. I've been there. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite all-time Mexican restaurants is right across from the Springville Art Museum, which is a, a jewel in the, in the middle of yeah. what used to be nowhere. It's probably very busy around there now. It's grown up a little. Uh, our studio is just two blocks from the museum, so it's, it's nice to have uh, that resource close. So are you originally from Springville, or how did you end up having your, your school there? No, I'm from Salt Lake. I grew up in Salt Lake uh, and uh, then went to... BYU, which, you know, is in Provo, um, and uh, after that went to the Florence Academy. So did you go to the BYU Art School? I studied illustration uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, I didn't know anything about art. Right. What, growing up, nobody around me did anything artistic, um, and so uh, studying something that had more of a commercial um, connotation to it seemed maybe a little bit more legitimate as a responsible decision uh, and uh, and then and then you know lucky enough um, because I the studio side was completely modern and and even though I didn't know anything about art I knew at least that what I wanted to do was something that looked like something, right? I wanted to do something representational. It was the only thing that really made any relevant sense to me. Uh, so the illustration side at least had um, some uh, tie to the, to the illustration tradition, which is, which is uh, you know, Howard Pyle and Dean Cornwell and J.C. Leyendecker. Well, and it has a great reputation. The BYU Illustration School has yeah. a great reputation. Yeah. I and think they've got a nice collection there. At the they school. have a really amazing collection at the museum um, and uh, and so that was uh, it was good for me as lucky because uh, at least I was doing figure drawing and head painting and um, those sorts of things you know about my junior year I think I realized I didn't want to do illustration um, I'm not interested in like doing book covers or time magazine or whatever but uh, they had an exhibition of Bert Silverman's work and it was the first time, again, I'm coming like as a blank slate. I don't know right. 
uh, anything about how, you, not, not only how you paint, but why you would paint or who cares. Uh, and uh, I, I went through the Burt Silverman show and for the first time felt like um, I was seeing somebody that was just doing what they wanted to do and making me really care about it. They, I completely fell in love with Burt Silverman's work immediately walking through that show and thought, if he can paint whatever he wants and make me care this deeply, maybe I could do that too. And, uh, and so that's when I really started thinking uh, I'd like to be a fine artist rather than, a, than an, a, an illustrator. Did you get a chance to meet Bert? Was he there for the opening? Yeah, I, I've, uh, I met him there. He spoke, did a little demonstration, um, and I've met him a number of times since. And um, I still can't add him on Facebook. I still don't know him well enough where he'll <laughs> add me on Facebook. <laughs> well, you'll just get his political rants anyway. So <laughs> I, I, I've been to his studio. Oh, we went as a BYU group uh -huh. uh, later on to his studio. Um, and so I've had a number of chances to really talk to him, um, but, uh, but still not Facebook friends. <laughs> He's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and a legend and in, in, in one of the greats that... Of, of our time, of our generation. Yeah, yeah. For me, as I um, have gotten older and older in the profession, I he st I still come back to him. Um, to me, he's um, not not only one of my original in, um, sources of inspiration, but um, he he's more of a reactionary painter to me than than a lot of others. What does that mean? Uh, to me, he, he doesn't seem to have a formula of, of painting. He, he seems to um, you know, have, have ideas and subjects that he wants to, to pursue, but, but when he starts to paint it, he allows the subject to, to dictate to a degree how it's painted, how it's handled. Uh, whereas you know, I see a lot of other painters that you know, they say, this is how I paint a figure, this is how I paint a portrait, and, it, and it's kind of a, a same sort of... Uh, process. Yeah, process that, that uh, um, is maybe a little bit less reactive to the particular subject. And, and I, I want that in, in my work. You know, if I'm painting a young girl or my daughter, I want to handle her in a far more sensitive way than paint, if I'm painting my dad, who is older and more wrinkly and, and just uh, harder, you know. Um, so, or, or, or a, a landscape or... Uh, you know, I'm gonna. I, I want to. I want to be able to really distinctly treat subjects in the way that they demand, uh, and and I see Bert Silverman doing that um, quite a bit. You know, he's been painting for so long. I, I, it's it's beyond instinct for him. I had the privilege of being painted by Bert. Yeah. And <clears throat> whenever I'm painted, when when I'm painted for the portraits at the magazine, I always ask that, number one, we do them live because I'm a believer in live portraiture and not photographic portraiture. Number two is I always like to have a mirror set up behind them so I can watch yeah. where my eyes are going so I can watch what they're painting. Yeah. And he had a likeness of me in three minutes. Yeah. I, I was completely blown away. Usually likeness comes after a couple of hours with with most painters and he just he just went psh, 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 like this yeah. and boom likeness was there. And then from that point forward he filled it out but that you know Bird is pro probably in his 80s yeah. and um, so he's probably been painting for 60 years. I guess that's what 60 years experience will do for you. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty phenomenal watching him work. He's such a brilliant draftsman, and, and uh, yeah, it's his sense of color and, and I mean, it sort of defies, which is, which is uncommon for, for someone of, of his age that came up in a time where painting the way he paints is just not okay. Uh, and, and he sort of defies any um, 
sort of time or style or um, you know, it just doesn't look like he learned how to paint in the 60s or 70s. He, he just, he just, it, like great music, you know, it just, it doesn't matter. It, you, you don't know when it was written. It's just a great song. Timeless. Yeah. Timeless. And, and he, a lot of work from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, they, they look like that. There's a certain coloration or a certain sort of um, style to it that, that uh, is very uh, in that moment. Kind of like Instagram photos, right? <laughs> yeah. That, that have the, you know, the, color, the discoloration of the right, photograph, right. which is much like what we got in the, you know, in the early stages of, yeah. of yeah. my childhood. So um, you discovered Bert, you're in school, what happened next? I just felt like I wasn't getting any better, but th that was more of a, an, like a, an underlying nagging, uh, more, than, more than a really conscious thing. Um, and, because again, I was coming from a, from a really naive um, standpoint, so I, I, I don't know that I could have even defined what better meant, you know? Right. Uh, and so, uh, I had a friend, fortunately, that had gone to a summer program at the Florence Academy, and, and so he started telling me uh, about the academy and, and showed me online. This was in 2000, probably end of 2001, 2002. Um, so they had a very basic website, uh, and, and I looked at the stuff, and um, I thought it was good, but again, like. I guess I, I, I felt like back then I was looking through everything with a thick fog. I, I, I thought it was good, but probably really more I thought it was better than what we were doing because he told me it was better than what we were doing, you know? I really didn't see it. I can totally relate to that, by the way. Yeah. Because I, I, uh, when I first took my first art lesson, um, the guy said, "Well, just slap some paint on the canvas and express yourself." And yeah. and I tried it, and it was like, "But can't you teach me how to paint that bottle?" And I couldn't even articulate what a still life was because I didn't even know what a still life was. I didn't know the terminology. And of course, he said, "Oh, that's passe. You don't want to do that." Right. But at that stage, and, and I think we forget sometimes now that we're at a different level, I think we forget that there are people who are watching this who are at that stage who don't don't know the names of the colors, yeah. don't know the, the types of art, don't know what's out there. I think one of the big problems we have today is that um, even though we have this huge movement of ateliers like yours who are teaching people how to do academic uh, drawing, painting, etc. Um, there are thousands and tens of thousands of art students out there who would crave that that don't even know it exists, right? Um, because they don't know what to even what Google terms to search for. Sure, and 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 even when they see it, um, they they don't know the difference. And I think I think that's a really important um, thing to understand for, for anybody watching or, um, it's a really important conversation I have all the time because running a school, we're just down the road from two major universities. And so we do get a lot of students coming in. Uh, and, and so I have this initial conversation with everybody because for me, it's, it's maybe one of the most important uh, uh, discussions and conversations any art student can have initially in in their development and that is uh, that y you have to understand two things one that there's no visual uh, training anywhere for anyone ever uh, it doesn't exist in you know from K through 12 where we don't have any sort of system that teaches you how to use your eyes in the same way as um, we learn the language, uh, um, uh, you know, we learn English or whatever, uh, we learn sentence structure and, and we learn how to spell and, and, you know, progress through writing sentences and on and on. We don't have that in, 
understanding how to, to train our mind to use our eyes. So what happens is we develop a functional sense of vision, which really just has to do with not falling downstairs uh, and driving and uh, um, not being a close talker or something. You know, it's, it's functional. Uh, and artists have to have a, a far better trained sense of vision because we're trying to communicate in that language. Uh, and that, that's a really particular um, training that is required to understand how to do that. And it doesn't exist. So well, when that's you not something that just comes, comes to you when, once you start studying nature, looking at light, painting outdoors, painting from life, don't you, don't you think that a lot of that just occurs naturally? Or are you saying that it, that it has to go beyond that? I think if you want to be great at something, you have to study it very, very deeply and not on your own, um, which, you know, is not a very pleasing idea in the current art world. A lot of uh, people want to wear the badge of self-taught. Uh, as it's, it's like a trophy they ha hang on their wall. Um, but if you consider any other uh, discipline, like math or science, or, or you know, if, would, you, would you ever take your, your kid to a self-taught doctor um, or, or have yourself defended by a self-taught lawyer? Um, there's so many complexities to um, drawing and painting that I, I really think if you want to be great at the thing, you have to you have to get training from somebody else who's great, um, and not. Uh, I think there's a tradition to it. There's an evolution of thought throughout the history of of art that that shows the development of of thought um, um, th from the Greeks through the Renaissance through the 19th century, and so there's there is information out there, and I think observation is is part of it for sure, but. Uh, it's not something that, um, uh, you know, people, people that are just observing are sort of trying to reinvent the information. They're trying to dis rediscover the information on their own. And that's, uh, you know, it's like trying to figure out calculus for the first time without just going to somebody who knows it and allowing them to kind of walk you through it. So I think, I think uh, drawing and painting is very similar to that. There are obviously always going to be people who have natural propensity to learn this or that. Uh, and, and so they'll, they'll uh, be able to pick things up a little bit more fluidly than, than other people might. But uh, still, I think the depth of knowledge, um, and depending, again, because not everybody wants to aim for mastery. Not everybody's trying to hang in the Met or compete with Velazquez. Uh, but, but for those that do want to do that, for those that do really want to adopt themselves into the tradition and, and be, you know, on the road to mastery, I think the training is, is uh, totally uh, necessary. Well, let's talk about the road to mastery. Um, I was at a dinner party at Fred Ross's house one evening, and there were a number of art historians, curators, artists, etc. And the discussion came up about mastery, what it, become, what it takes to become a master. And one artist, whose name I don't recall at the moment, said, um, for someone of my age, at the time much younger, probably 10 years ago, he said, it's not possible for you. He said, it's only possible for somebody who's 15, 16, 18, 20, 25 years old, if they work hard at it, by the time your age, they'll hit mastery. And, and I'm not so sure I agree with that. Maybe it's because I don't want to agree with it. What do you think? Um, well, well, I think there's different le levels of mastery, too. And, and I, I don't want to get caught up in, in trying to define exactly what mastery is or, or how... You, you know, individuals can achieve it. I think, I think every individual has to be really concerned with, um, and again, it depends on their goals, uh, because, because painting is just really fun for a lot of people, and, and they don't want the pressure of, of trying to be 
you know, really that brilliant. Um, and that's okay. I, you know, I think you have to be true to yourself and say, this is what I'm in it for. But for those people that are really just, they want to make it their whole life and, and um, achieve something great, I think it's important for them to, to say, uh, you know, I, I, although this is my goal, my reality is, is also this, and uh, I'm, my mastery, I want to get as good as I can get. And so, uh, um, you know, that's an important part of the conversation uh, to me because it's, it's a little bit more f fairly individual. But uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think for sure the younger mind is more malleable. It, it, it soaks up information uh, a lot faster. Um, the difference to me would be that when someone <clears throat> at a younger age is able to absorb uh, and digest the information, foundational information, really basic information, become a great draftsman uh, um, in, in terms of like accuracy or, or uh, all the fundamentals uh, early on, the only difference would be is the amount of time they have to evolve into uh, um, uh, higher and higher thinking. So uh, you, you, for me, uh, you know, like uh, Dan Graves, Jacob Collins, I feel, like, I feel like these guys that started kind of bringing the, these academic principles back, they, uh, you know, they had to spend a lot of time trying to piece things back together. And fortunately for my generation, they did. But I feel like we probably, as a result of that, got it 10 times faster than they did, which allows us then uh, that much more time to think about higher things. And then, and then the, hopefully the people that I'm teaching, that opens up time for them to uh, consider higher things. So I think it's really dependent on, on someone, the, the mental development of somebody because I think that's where the mastery occurs is when your mind gets to a point like Bert Silverman, like we were talking about earlier, where um, it can consider uh, things that go that need to be considered in order to create masterpieces. Uh, and, and I don't think that that's necessarily age specific, but I do think that it's development specific and development does take time. So uh, uh, you know, if somebody gets going a little bit later, they may just have to like dive into it deeper. They may have to be more disciplined. They may have to spend more time with it uh, to to play a little bit of time catch up. But uh, I don't think it's off limits for them. For the person who doesn't know, help me understand what the process would be in your particular school. Um, it's based on academic process, which many of the ateliers are doing. Can, can you give us the specifics in, in your school? Yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of uh, you know, fa trying to fashion ourselves uh, as much as possible after a 19th century curriculum, um, which I think uh, you know, a lot of the ateliers are, are probably doing. Um, the, the three pillars uh, of the 19th century were uh, the copying from the antique, um, which in our case is, is, we start with bar drawings. A lot of people don't know what bar drawings are. Maybe you can articulate that for them. Yeah, uh, Charles Barg was, um, um, I think he was actually a lithographer in the, in the 19th century. He did a lot of the lithography for, for uh, some of the most famous artists. Uh, and then uh, um, the government, the French government, um, commissioned a drawing course to, to, that they would adopt and, and teach at the Beaux-Arts. And, uh, and uh, so he, under the direction of Jean-Léon Jerome, created a, an entire drawing course. It took him 10 years uh, to develop, and then they adopted that. And, um, and so we're using that drawing course now, the plates from that course. Uh, and, and it's really, it's so brilliantly designed um, to help students understand really fundamental principles from the very beginning. Uh, and and uh, they learn they learn how to see uh, with with uh, through going through the drawing course and it's just a, it's a brilliantly designed progression for students. It's like they're you know learning the ABCs of seeing. That's B A R G B A R G U E. Right, yeah, Barg. Charles Barg. Yeah, uh, and, and, and it's a beautiful book. There's a yeah. there's a volume and it's 
probably an eighty or hundred dollar, two hundred dollar book. I don't know, yeah. but it's very worthwhile. What I do is that I scanned all of the the uh, Barg drawings and I put them in my iPad. Yeah, and then I can practice them when I'm on an airplane. I set up the iPad and I set up a yeah. sketching pad, and so that's that's how I get my drawing in. But it's it's valuable for anybody to start yeah. there. Yeah, Jerry Ackerman, who recently died, unfortunately, he, uh, he you know he went to, and studied at the Florence Academy and and drew these plates uh, to to know how better to write the book and and kind of compile all of this. So um, it's a great resource that that you know anybody should get. Uh, but we start with that. You get, you know our students go through two or three copies. Um, in pencil and then two or three in, in charcoal, um, and and then they go to cast drawing, uh, which is also under that pillar of uh, copying from the antique. Uh, the second pillar is copying from nature, which is uh, obviously uh, figure, portraiture, still life, uh, landscape painting. Which um, you know we've got a figure in the in the studio each day uh, that students uh, study from. Uh, and then uh, the third pillar of the 19th century was uh, um, uh, copying from the masters. And that's the, that's the one pillar that n doesn't necessarily exist in a lot of the schools. Um, uh, not that people aren't looking at the masters, but that as part of the we weekly curriculum, um, doing master copies is, is uh, not generally you know, part of it. Uh, a lot of the reason for that, especially you know, for us, is is uh, access to. You don't have the Louvre in your backyard. Yeah, uh, which is one of the reasons I've been working uh, towards moving school to Paris, uh, so that we have access to that and we can add that back to the curriculum. I think that's really important uh, in terms of artistic development. Um, maybe one of the most, maybe the most important thing uh, for me is, uh, and and because. You can learn to see accurately with bar drawings. You can learn to, uh, and cast drawings as well. It's just so, the, the, the exercises, the way that they're taught, uh, there's so much information um, in, in those exercises. You can learn to see uh, as well through, through drawing the figure in the portrait. Um, you can start to understand elements of form and space and weight, uh, uh, character and rhythm. But there's, there's no part of that curriculum that teaches you how to develop your personal vision. Uh, and no part of that curriculum that also teaches you why you're learning how to see so well. Uh, and, and how to apply those principles to, to something deeply artistic. Uh, and I think a lot of students adopt the the idea that then the study is the art, and so a, a lot of students coming out of the ateliers at the moment are are um, creating works that are that are portrait, uh, still life oriented, but sort of without any uh, deep artistic purpose, and and I think that's where studying the masters. Is, is really evident, or the lack of studying the masters is really evident. And uh, in the 19th century, you had uh, that as part of the core curriculum, and you had this really personal development uh, of, of the individual artist, and there was a heritage that, that was theirs because of that one pillar. Uh, when, they, when they were developing the basic essential skills, they were also they also had a really clear goal by spending all that time with great master works. Uh, they knew what art was, they knew uh, why it was important, and they knew how then to, to create works that were relevant and, and had a certain power for a public. And, and for me, uh, one of the ideas that I really want to pass on um, not only to my students but conversationally other artists is that art is is a service oriented pursuit that although it's personal and we make it for us because there's something in us that, that kind of drives us to do that that what we're making is for other people it's for the service of other people 
And I think if people can consider that, the work that they make uh, will become more meaningful, not only to themselves, but, but for a, a, a public. Um, is so much of the work being done, you know, even in, you know, just speaking of the representational world, because, you know, I think trying to put uh, uh, representation and, and, you know, total abstraction in, in the same room is not really relevant. Um, but, uh, you know, even within representation, there's so much ambiguity, and uh, it just doesn't have. I mean, everybody's trying to be unique or try to cross over into the, the other realm to, for, for monetary reasons, for popularity reasons. Uh, um, and I think there's this really forced ambiguity to represent, a lot of representational painting that does not connect with an audience, uh, that still plays into that uh, postmodern mentality of, of um, you know, shock value or, or, or really deliberate obscurity that... Um, makes it seem deep, but is really just obscure. And, well, uh, what makes it seem deep is perhaps a, um, a, a way of accomplishing what you just said. You know, that, of course, in the, in the world of modernism, um, there's an awful lot of uh, people telling you, well, this is good, but not being able to say why it's good. Right. At least in my opinion. So that may... So, so I, I know of the artists that you're talking about, specifics, and trying to play to the, to kind of crossing the line between the classical and being very relevant in today's world. What's wrong with that? I think I think if it's if it's uh, sincere and deliberate, uh, and you're, you're trying to. You're working your way through um, trying to explain something, and it, and you you're just trying you're figuring it out, and and um, uh, and it's really purposeful uh, for the message of the art. Um, then then it's relevant. Uh, you know, I think I think there's a lot of people doing that whose work I might see as obscure. But it, it's really purposeful, uh, and and when you get to talk to the artist, um, you get a, a sense of the the depth of thought that goes into it. But but a lot of a lot of it is um, just trying to pander to a, a market, being commercial, being commercial, and and uh, and I think there's a big difference between those two uh, pursuits. Um, but, but isn't that uh, if I could challenge that for just a second, isn't that why a lot of people paint? Is that you know they paint because they want to paint what they love, but they also want their work to be embraced by a buying public. Uh, sure. What's wrong with commercialism? Nothing. If if uh, you know a lot of people um, really. I, it's it's priorities for the individual, and and if somebody's priority is to make money and be financially stable, there's you can't fault that. You know, I've got five kids, and I know what it's like to be financially stable and not financially stable. So, you know, a lot of people uh, are going to make certain decisions for commercial reasons, uh, and it's fine. You you, you don't want to fault people for their life situation or their decisions that they're making. Um, I, I guess the fault I would find <clears throat> is uh, in trying to, to um, when, is when it's artificial. Uh, you know, when people are playing the more purist card and, and it's clearly commercial, uh, um, that's probably what bothers me the most is, uh, you know, when people are honest about it, fine. Uh, but when you when, when you uh, try to pretend to you know, be something that you're not, um, I think you can see it in the work, uh, and uh, uh, and that's again to go back to this the service oriented pursuit. I, I just think when you make your work um, or the great the greatest power the the work with the greatest power to me um, has always been the work that really considered its audience. And uh, and that's definitely something that that I want to I want to do. 
Yeah. You, know, you know, service orientation obviously has a lot to do with what your own life is about, where you live, what your audience yeah. is. You know, if you live in, let's say, New York City or L.A. versus Utah or, you know, Miami, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of different cultural um, approaches yeah. one might take that is servicing that particular yeah. world. Now, you have an interesting, you said something about, you know, you have five kids to feed. Yeah. You clearly could be more commercial than you are and probably make a lot more money than you do by crossing a certain line. What would that line be for you that you're not willing to cross? Um, my, in, in my experience, um, my perception is that uh, being really commercially successful quickly can be done very easily by doing one thing and you don't even have to do it well, you just have to do a lot of it and then market it well. Uh, and I've seen so many artists um, that have kind of followed that pattern. And there's a couple of things that, that happen when you do that. One is I think the buying audience thinks that you, you um, that what you're doing is, is far more purposeful and, and uh, there's a deeper motivation behind the art because you're doing one thing, say painting bears, whatever, this guy must really care about bears. And, and, and then you, you, you start to play the card of being an environmentalist or, or I, I don't know, you come out with bear playing cards or whatever. Um, but you brand yourself uh, by doing one thing. Uh, and again, it doesn't have to even be done well. It just has to be done a lot. Uh, and once people know about it, they want it. You know, I think that's one thing that I've learned is people want what they've heard of. And, uh, and it's, it's easier to say, I'm the guy that makes red Levi's. And anytime anybody wants red Levi's, they know who to go to. Uh, well, and we find, you know, in, in, in the magazine world, we see this every day. We see artists who are advertising a landscape and then you get to their website and they have 500 other different things. Yeah. And we hear that the audiences are confused. Yeah. And so part of it, you know, from my particular standpoint, I want to do a little bit of everything because I get bored easily. Yeah. I want to, I'm interested in landscape painting. I'm interested in still life. I'm interested in portraiture. Yeah. Um, to some extent, if somebody focuses exclusively on one thing they can get really good at it really good at painting yeah. bears um, or just really efficient or really efficient right yeah uh, and that's really helpful uh, so when it's you're... becoming a production right you know, what 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 I think I hear you saying is that you don't necessarily think that one becoming a production house uh, where you know you're just cranking out things of the same thing is is valuable. Uh, well, I'm sort of like you, like, you know, I'm interested in everything. And, and so I'm not saying that it's not valid. Uh, you know, it's not what you want to do. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like I've, I'm, you know, coming across as really downplaying all these other people's decisions and, and being very judgmental about them. Um, that's not it. It's just, you know, looking at the different op options for myself. Um, I see that as one of them, and, and, and I had an opportunity to do that at, at a certain point. I was doing a lot of, of small invented landscapes. I think you, you own one. And uh, yeah, everybody really loved them. Um, they were very simple, uh, kind of ethereal, soft, moody. They, they were, I, I got really fast at doing them, and uh, the galleries were asking for them, collectors were asking for them, and it just... Um, it got to a point where uh, I, I could have turned it into a whole thing. A machine. Yeah, and, and, and the machine never would have faltered. It would have, uh, it would have just kept going. Um, because as soon as, as soon as you saturate the first 20 people, the next 40 people just heard about it. And there's so many people in the world that you think you're going to paint yourself out of market, and you, you won't. Um, there's just so many people. And... Uh, 
And so, you know, I had that opportunity to, to do those invented landscapes and just keep going and going. And, and, and it really wasn't a decision for me because what it, I started to do those invented landscapes to prove what I knew about landscape. I just wanted to see how far I could push uh, invention and it was really exciting in the beginning. But after I'd done so many, I started to prove what I didn't know about landscape painting. It got very frustrating. And so, so at a certain point, it started to feel like I was, I was making stuff. It, it was like I was trying to print money on canvas, and it didn't feel like I was pushing myself artistically anymore. It didn't feel like you were being true to yourself. Yeah, I wasn't learning. I wasn't... I, wasn't, uh, I was actually... It felt like a lie. It felt like, you know, I'm, I can paint this and I can make it pretty like you want it, but it looks exactly the same as the last 20 things I painted and, and why would you want that? And I want to do something new. I want to, I want to learn something new. And, uh, and that's actually, you know, I had a break in my studies um, between uh, 2003 and 2006 uh, where I, you know, I went in 2003 to Florence Academy, ran out of money and had to come home for three and a half years. And that's when that happened, and 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 it was sort of, you know, they they I had an article in American Art Collector, and and they specifically said, you know, Ryan Brown, a landscape painter, and I and and that was part of what led me to think like I can't be this. I want to be a painter. I want to be an artist. I don't even know if I want to be a painter because I'm interested in sculpture, and you know, what if I want to make a a coffee table at some point, and I, I want that to be valuable as well. Um, so uh, that's when I decided to go back to the Florence Academy. I knew I had to get better at, at doing the figure um, and, and kind of extend my range and uh, abilities. And now I think uh, to go back you know, to the original point, um, that's my decision. Um, that's my priority uh, that probably takes me a little bit less commercial uh, is that I'm very, very interested in a lot of things and I want to paint each of them with as uh, a great of ability as, as, as possible. So I'm looking at the long run. I'm saying in, 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 20, in 20 years, hopefully you'll be able to look back at the body of work and see a common thread. Um, whereas in the beginning, people are probably going to be confused. What, is the, what does he do? Uh, and, and saying, well, he's just a painter is, is not enough. He's a, he's a wildlife artist. He's a landscape painter. He's a plein air painter. Uh, he's a portrait painter. You know, people want to some, sort of compartmentalize you and know what you're about. And I'm just about painting things that stir me. Um, you know things that I feel have to be painted. That things that awaken, need to be put on awaken in your soul. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, it's just merely a choice, and it's it, it's admirable to be able to do that. Uh, there's an artist in your area by the name of John Coleman, who's a very famous Western artist, but he sculpts, he does landscapes, he does still lifes, he does a lot, he does what he wants to do. Now they all tend to be. Western in nature, probably because he lives in the West and he loves the West. Yeah. But uh, it, at least he's he's doing what he wants. You know, George Carlson did, be, became a very wealthy, successful sculptor, and then one day it said, "I'm done with sculpting. I'm moving to painting." So I think it's a it's a choice. I, I have friends who land on something that's very successful and they say, you know what, this is what I want to do. I want to produce the same thing yeah. over and over and over again for the rest of my life and I'm happy doing that. Yeah. And, and I think every artist has to make their choice. It's not necessarily a bad or a good thing. Yeah. I do think there are lines that need to be drawn. Yeah. For instance, um, you know, painting the same scene over and over again and selling it at an art show over and over again yeah. because it sells, you know, that, but then again, that's more of a commercial venture, you know, sure. that's more along the lines of what some others would do manufacturing wise. Anyway, I digress. Yeah, I, I think the, I think uh, for me, the pri you, you have to um, say, what do I ultimately want to achieve? And this is for every artist, really sit down and say, what do I ultimately want to achieve? 
and, and how can I get there? And for some, it's going to be financial prosperity first, so, that, so they feel like they can, they, have, they can gain the freedom to do um, the things that may be more personal. And that's totally valid. So you have to, um, no matter what your decision is, you have to very, be very specific about your priorities. Right. And my priority, I've decided, is going to get, develop a higher and higher level of mastery in what I'm doing so that I can more cleanly express what I want to express. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being best, uh, do you see yourself as a, uh, where, where would you see yourself as a painter? In terms of your interest, not in terms of your mastery, but in terms of your interest as a painter. Um, I, wa I, wanna, I wanna hang in the Met someday. Okay, now what about as, as a, a teacher, because you're you're living in two worlds, you're a teacher and you're a painter. Where do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be, which, which is more important to you? You know, I, I think uh, teaching is, is, for me, it's more of conversational and, and a friendship. I, I, don't, um, I don't see myself as some sort of iconic teacher. I, I see myself, um, you know, when, I, when, when students come in, I, I feel like I'm just sharing information with a friend. You know? Yeah, but you're very um, passionate about teaching. You, you know, I've had yeah. conversations with you in the past, and you are driven to help these students find what you found. Yeah, you know, I think I think it's 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 like I, yeah, I feel like I was so fortunate to be able to get this information um, and and develop, and it, it, it was such a a life-changing, eye-opening experience to go from the blindness we were talking about earlier at the university, where I just I didn't see, I didn't know, total naivete, to um, somebody just taking you by the hand and showing you something, and then opening the door for you to really do something personal and and something that you never could have done before without that, and so that's kind of. The motivation for me is is uh, it's like handing out free candy. You know, it's it's really simple. This information is very accessible, and it will change your life. It's not easy. Uh, it's free and accessible, but it's not. Well, easy. yeah, you have to you have to develop a a, a pretty good discipline and and work ethic. Uh, you really have to fight for it. But but it's accessible. That's what I mean by easy. Is is it's accessible, uh, and and so I feel like. Teaching is really not an option. It's 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 like like I have I was I was given the information, and and it's not mine, and and so it's only valuable if I give it away, um, and uh, yeah. So it's not yeah. It's, it's it's not even an option for me. Well, so. you're in, you're in some interesting lineage. If you trace back the lineage of the Florence Academy. So you go to Daniel, you go to Florence Academy, which is Daniel Graves, yeah. who studied under Signorita Simi, mm -hmm. who studied under her father, Federico, who studied under Jerome, I believe. There may have been one step in between. Yeah, yeah I think Dan also worked some with Richard Lack. He did. And with, there's a nice uh, lineage that way, too. Yes, there is. And, and there may have been somebody else in the middle of all that, too. Maybe, uh, maybe... Um, Riley, Frank Riley, I'm, I'm trying to remember, but it, it's interesting because those, those techniques were passed down. I studied under a man who studied with, with Simi as well yeah. and was able to take what he learned from her. I never mastered it, but the, so, so you're very fortunate to be able to, to have that and then to be able to pass it forward because it was almost lost. Yeah. I mean, if it were not for a couple of brave souls, quite frankly, who kept it alive in the face of modernism when they were complete outcasts yeah. doing things that nobody wanted. Yeah. And even Bert Silverman told me he was at a time he's doing things when nobody wanted. The, the students today need to understand that they're living in a very special time because when I started Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine, which has been, I don't know, at least a decade or more ago, um, there were basically three or four ateliers. Yeah. There was nothing. 
and it has changed so dramatically. And, and, and then there were um, a couple of, maybe, you know, a hundred people who were studying in total. Today there are probably a few thousand who are studying in total because the second and third generation of these people have popped up with ateliers all around the, right. the world. So they're very fortunate and this is a special time and probably moving into a time when this kind of work will get higher appreciation. Mm -hmm. My sense is that guys like yourself who are at this kind of cusp of the next generation, you know, the, the Daniel Graves and the Jacob Collins are going to be the old guys one day and then you're going to shift in and be the, the top guys and by the time that happens we may see the works that you're doing being highly revered as much as we're seeing the highly revered modern works today selling for massive prices because there's a shift in the thinking about art there uh, the younger people are really not interested in what their parents generation was interested in it and their grandparents generation and their great grandparents generation which was essentially a modernism movement which may be fading and a representational movement may be moving forward. Yeah. Or then again, it may be wishful thinking. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I think there's a strong enough market. You know, obviously, there is a, a pretty um, drastic difference between the, the amount of money in the um, you know, postmodern, whatever you want to call it, abstract world and, and the representational world. But the representational world is very strong. There's a, there's, it's, it's growing. Um, and and uh, it is a lot of financial power behind it, enough for everybody that's great, you know. And, and so whether we sell for 25,000, 250,000, or 25 million, I think is, you know, it's not, I don't even care. You know, if I can, if I can do what I want to do with my life and I have kind of the, enough finances to do that and, and raise my kids in a good way and in a good home, I, I don't need to sell for $25 million. I'm not, I'm not really concerned about that. Um, well, there's a danger that goes with that. And that is sure. that, you know, it could become much like the postmodernism world where you look at some of these well-known popular artists today, which are basically factories. Yeah. And, right. you know, the guy comes up with a concept and says, here, go make this. Right. And then it sells for $200 million. Yeah and it changes the nature of things. And yeah. so we have to be very careful what we wish for because yeah. if the demand is high and we start cranking things out and, and, and losing the sensitivities yeah. that go with it, that's where we, we stand to, to lose. Yeah. We may win financially. There's a, there's a lot of artists in history that had a lot of financial success in their time. Um, I mean, everybody, the, the, the running joke that we all hear is, uh, you know, you, you'll be famous when you die, or you'll you'll make a lot of money when you die. Not necessarily true. Most artists are are far better known in their lifetime. Um, well, that's all because of the whole Van Gogh thing, because he became right. so popular. But yeah, yeah. But, but Messonnier and and Bouguereau, they they were very um, well off in their time, and and I think what it does is it really frees you up to um, you spend more time on each project, um, potentially, um, uh, and, and, and so financial stability for me just uh, means a little bit more freedom to, to explore more deeply what I'm doing. The, the reason I think, and maybe this, maybe this will make the video, maybe it won't, because uh, maybe it's relevant, maybe it's not, but the reason I think it won't ever really shift is, is purely financial. I think that um, when you're talking about representational painting, it comes with a certain set of pretty distinguishable standards, uh, and and when you're talking about what dirty diapers in a corner or uh, you know a blank canvas with like a really lame joke typed on it or any any sort of art like that, um, there's nothing by which you can judge it. And and for investors, people like the the Gagosians or or people with lots and lots of money who are, who are putting hundreds of millions of dollars into this stuff. Um, you have a market that has no oversight. 
If, if, you, if you're a real estate investor, then the architect, location, materials used to build it, square footage, all of these things play into its value. And although those things can fluctuate, there is a standard by which they're judged. And art has, you, you can't, you, there, there's no oversight. If you, if you own a company and you go public and you falsify information, then you could go to prison. That you can't falsify art. You can't say this is, you can say this is worth $35 million and people will just believe it and then it's worth $35 million. And so for that reason alone, when you're talking about the amount of money that is in that type of work, um, I don't think you're ever going to change it because representational work can be judged. Well, and I'm not so sure that the people who control that world want that to be changed because yeah. if it changes, then they can't manufacture, you know, the next great thing. Right, right. Tell people yeah, they're, the they're in complete is. control of the market, and they're they're making mountains and mountains of money uh, off of the fact that it's an investment that has no oversight, uh, and you can't lie about it. You know, so well, you can invent anything, and you're inventing wealth basically. And and I don't know that you can do that with representational painting because you can say that's drawn poorly. Or you can say uh, I mean, whatever you want, there's, there's something recognizable. It's measurable. That, yeah. Yeah, well, it's the same with music. You know, it, it, and even though there is jazz, which is improvised, yeah. um, it's based on a scale, right? It's based on a system. If someone just got out there and started blowing notes, and not notes, just making noises, right. you know, that, that would almost be the equivalent of what we're seeing in the abstract, postmodernism, yeah. et cetera. And, and so basically what we're doing or what you're doing is you're teaching foundational principles. Where they go on top of that yeah. is up to, the, up to the individual. Yeah. Yeah, we want to give them the tools and then let them follow their path. So today you're, you're still a relatively young man. You have a young family. You have five children. What are their names? Chloe, Brody, Abby... Charlotte and Aiden. So that's four girls. Four girls. One boy. One boy. What's the age range? Thirteen to three. Wow. Yeah. And a lot of pressure. Um. I guess I don't know any dif anything different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess it seems normal to me. Uh, they're really good models, so uh, I've been I, I'm getting into. Uh, painting my kids a lot more, which is dangerous because uh, I never want to sell them. So uh, I've got to, uh, my life is all about a very delicate balance. I, you know, I run the school, I teach every day, uh, I, I, I have to manage the whole thing and, and try and, you know, run that whole side of the business. I have to paint on my own. I have to figure out which projects I'm working on. I got to coach my son's basketball team. I mean, there's a lot going on. And uh, especially in terms of choosing projects, there's a lot of things. Um, I've never been more passionate about every single project I'm working on. I, I, I have maybe 20 paintings I'm working on, and, and I love them completely. I think each one is like the best thing I've ever done or designed. And so it's, it's sometimes hard to choose. Um, you know, half of those are things I'll never sell, and half of them are things I, I will sell. So trying to balance that out uh, uh, can be somewhat difficult. Yeah, but that's important. You know, if you go to the Soroya Museum or the Soroya House yeah. and you see all his personal paintings of his family and how wonderfully executed they are, they're almost more beautiful than anything else yeah. he's, he's done because you can tell his heart is really in it. And you can see the progression of his kids from, you know, lying in bed with mom as right. a baby to a, as an adult. That's pretty cool to see. It's nice that they kept that collection together. Yeah. Yeah. For me, um, the more personal the subject, the more compelled I feel um, to, to follow it. Uh, you know, I've, I've kind of moved um, from things that I just I want to paint because they're beautiful and I have those paintings you know the the main motivation is I find it beautiful uh, uh, to things I find beautiful and are are deeply personal uh, you know I, I did um, 
you know, just did the, the figure in the landscape. And it's something that kind of started, I talked about in the video, it started with seeing my daughter in the woods. She, we were camping and, you know, she pooped her pants and we had to change her and we're seeing there, you know, standing there naked in the woods and, and seeing the flesh against the green and whatever. It, 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 that was my initial thought. I, I need to start painting the figure in the landscape because that connection um, between the flesh tones and the greenery is, is amazing. Uh, and now I'm working on a, a large painting of all four of my daughters in the woods. And, and the excitement I have for painting these models in the woods is deep. I mean, it's so beautiful, the color harmonies you can get and uh, this natural quality when, you, when you're putting these, all of the brilliance of, of painting a figure into the landscape. Uh, there's a really beautiful connection. But working on the one of my daughters, that, the one of my daughters is like, the most meaningful painting I've ever made, and uh, and it's uh, that's uh, it's just a deeper motivation. There's something really deeply that I'm deeply connected to the subject matter, um, and it's not just about making a really beautiful painting. It's now it's personal, and um, so I you know I've kind of moved in that direction, but that's a hard direction to move in because I just. I don't ever want to sell that right. stuff, and right. as, as, you know, I'm, I'm, so many of the things I'm working on is that, and so it's, it's really uh, financially just a bad idea <laughs> to be spending so much time on that stuff. I can't help it. If the clock stopped ticking and today was your last day, what would you want to be remembered for? Um, I want my kids to remember that I was funny, that I was a fun guy, that, that I really, really loved my family. If they knew that, I think, you know, that's good. You know, if they had that, those memories, uh, I, I think that's probably the most important thing. What's a great answer? Good. <laughs> yeah, painting is, painting is just painting. It's just, you know, if I make something great and people like it, that's great, but that's um, you know, it's kind of to the side of everything else. So, Well, thank you for your time today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, that was Ryan S. Brown painting the figure outdoors. And you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Remember, we have a special discount code on that video for you today in the comments section. Thank you for watching. Figure painting can touch people on a deep and profound emotional level. And there's no question that landscape painting can do the same. But when you combine these two art forms, you come away with something that is truly magical. Now you can learn the techniques of painting the figure in the landscape from a master painter who is the head of an important figure painting school, the Center for Academic Study and Naturalist Painting. In the all new Painting the Figure in Nature instructional video, Ryan Brown provides you all the tools, all the theory, and all the techniques you need to produce your own masterpiece in this rare and exciting style. I might move these rocks, I might add rocks, I might take things away. I, I might change the, the whole complexion of, of this tree or whatever um, because as I'm um, painting it, I'm, I'm making decisions and I'm making decisions in terms of drawing as well. Same with the figure. I'm going to get a lot more particular with the painting um, as I go, but I, I, if I'm too careful and create like sort of like a, a cartoon outline uh, or a coloring book outline, I just get I get timid and I start to I start to like want to preserve that too much and and uh, at, at this point I'm con I'm really confident in my drawing skills so whatever whatever really really fine decisions I'm going to make final decisions I'm going to make in paint I want to do with the brush so so this drawing is sort of a guide but it's malleable I consider it malleable you'll discover how to use your sketches to establish movements balance tones create the various elements of your scene and better define your work 
the common mistakes beginner and intermediate painters make and how to avoid them. Ryan will also demonstrate how to use anatomical landmarks to guide your adjustments to the figure, how to paint reflections of the sky, trees, rocks, and the figure on water, how to bring clarity to the different landscape elements and develop your figure so the solutions to your painting reveal themselves. You'll also learn how to make the small, subtle adjustments that make your figure more dynamic, and much, much more. Not only will you get to learn from a true master painter who studied at the prestigious Florence Academy of Art, you'll also gain key insights into both figure painting and landscape painting that you simply won't find anywhere else. Painting the Figure in Nature with Ryan Brown is now available on DVD and streaming video.